Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming, uh, for joining us here either in Silver Spring at the NOAA Central Library or virtually over webinar uh, to our first 2019 Sea Grant Canals Fellow Brown Bag Seminar Series. Uh, on the third Thursday of every month, the Canals Fellows will be presenting on their research or current work, uh, so be sure to stop in and hear about all the interesting stuff that they do. I would like to also thank Erin and Katie for helping us here at the library getting set up and getting the ball rolling. My name is Christine Hurt. I'm a Sea Grant Canals Fellow with the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. I'm here to introduce our presenter for today, Marla Valentine. So Marla is a Canals Fellow working as the International Fisheries Science Specialist with the Office of Science and Technology. She graduated from Louisiana State University in 2013 with a Master of Science degree in Oceanography that's centered on deep sea benthic ecology using ROVs and AUVs following the Deepwater Horizon incident. Marla defended her doctorate at Old Dominion University in 2018, fo focusing on biogeochemical cycling of nutrients in coastal marine ecosystems, focusing specifically on the Florida Keys. And between her degrees, Marla worked for several marine research labs from Alabama to Delaware to Alaska, studying sharks, alligators, and finfish fisheries, acoustic and satellite telemetry, and aquatic invasive species. So please join me in welcoming Marla. Good afternoon, everybody, or mid-morning. I never know what noon is. Today I'll be talking to you about some of my dissertation research, which focused on the complex interactions of marine sponges and coastal marine ecosystems. My clicker worked. Maybe. Still no go. So first I'll be giving you a brief overview of sponge evolutionary history and some of their biology. I'll be following this up with apparently nothing. <laughs> so I'll be following this up with um, a discussion of how sponge identity, biomass, and tidal regime can affect <clears throat> um, our tropical marine ecosystems. Oh, yes. I'll follow this by discussing how diverse assemblages of sponges can also interact with various <clears throat> ecosystem functions. And then I'll go over the competitive interactions of sponges and the stability of their microbiomes over time before finally giving you some concluding remarks that we can draw from this body of work. So sponges are members of phylum periphera. This means pore bearer and they're relics of our evolutionary history. They're the first and most simple members of metazoa in our ancestral lineage of animals, and they're found in the fossil record between Cambrian and Precambrian times approximately 480 to 760 million years ago. Now, the preservation potential for sponges is poor. They're soft, squishy tissues, and the only fossil records that we do have are for those few species with siliceous spicules. So given the long evolutionary history of these organisms, it's reasonable to hypothesize that these peripherans have played a significant role in the development of coastal water processes. So globally, there are nearly 10,000 known species of sponge. They're found in freshwater, the deep sea, Antarctica, but most commonly in coastal marine ecosystems. Their morphology is incredibly diverse. They're balls, branchings, bases, encrusting sheets, they can be smaller than golf balls or larger than a human being. And the oldest known individual sponge is approximately 15,000 years old, making it the longest living organism in the world. Oopsies, here we go, all right. Sponges are sessile organisms and they're formed of complex mixtures of totipotent cells, which means they can rapidly regenerate lost or damaged tissues at a rate of 2,900 times their normal somatic growth rate. Now the outer layer of the sponge is called the panachoderm, and water is pulled in through these small pores called ostea through a central chamber before being <coughs> uh, sent out of the sponge through the central osculum at the top of the sponge. And this movement of water provides a sponge with food, oxygen, and waste removal. And much of this water movement is driven by coanocytes up here, 
and the central flagella of this coenocyte will beat, and these line the entire central chamber, and this is what is drawing the filtration of water through the sponge. And some sponges have filtration capabilities of 20,000 times their volume in a 24-hour period and can remove 90% of the bacteria in the water column. Wrong button. So marine sponges typically have close symbiotic relationships with a variety of microorganisms, archaea, bacteria, and eukaryota. And these microbial consortiums are diverse and complex, and they perform a wide range of functional roles, including vitamin synthesis, production of bioactive and defensive compounds, and biochemical transformations of nutrients. Now this microbial classification is a key contributor to the distribution of sponge um, classifications. So we have two groups, the high microbial abundant sponges, which I'm going to call HMA, which have two to four orders of magnitude greater microbial densities than LMA sponges. Now these HMA sponges tend to have narrower, denser canals, which restricts the movement of water and creates areas of high anaerobic activity which is where we see the majority of bacterial nutrient transformations occurring. So analogous to that microbial loop that Azan came up with in the 1980s, in 2013, we saw the development of the, micro or the sponge loop. And this serves to transfer and convert nutrients through oligotrophic food webs. And the sponge loop is hypothesized to explain Darwin's paradox of how highly productive and diverse coral reef ecosystems occur in what is essentially a marine desert. So sponges consume dissolved organic material. They process it internally. They also consume primary producers. And then this is processed and released as particulate organic matter, which is then consumed by detritivores and other sponges. So sponges are major components of the three-dimensional structure in marine ecosystems in what is otherwise featureless substrate. And as can be seen here, sponges provide a variety of habitat for juvenile reef fishes and the Caribbean spiny lobster, which I would like to point out is a multi-million dollar fishery for the state of Florida. Sponges are also habitat for microorganisms, and this ranges from baby crabs and octopus to snapping shrimp which create noise that guide recruitment patterns. So if any of you have ever been diving or snorkeling near a reef or in hard bottom, hear that snap, crackle, pop, that Rice Krispie treat sound. And that is due to these eusocial snapping shrimp that live inside of the tissues of sponges. So just to review, sponges have a myriad of effects on the environments in which they're found, and their functional roles include cementing and scouring. They're acting as ecosystem engineers. Their habitat for a number of commercially and recreationally valuable fisheries. And they have home for a variety of charismatic fauna. They're filter feeders, they're consuming planktonic organisms, and through their complex interactions with bacterial symbionts, they're strong contributors to the benthopelagic cycling of nutrients. Who knew sponges could do so much? <laughs> so humans have had a direct impact on sponge assemblages worldwide. They've been intensively harvested since the 1800s, and there have been very few assessments of the consequences of their removals on the aforementioned ecosystem functions. So most people don't know, but we actually have several sponge fisheries here in the United States. Several are in the state of Florida, particularly in Tarpon Springs and the Florida Keys, where an artisanal fishery still exists. So at the scale of ecosystem, we have harmful algal blooms, or HABs, and these will effectively clear sponges from an ecosystem. And the impacts of these events occur throughout the United States. And in the Florida Keys, at least, prior to a series of HABs, the population of organisms in the Florida Keys was largely dominated by sponges, both in terms of biomass and spatial coverage. So it's reasonable to hypothesize that given the reports of their impressive filtration rates and abilities to fix nutrients, the effects of these losses have been great. So we lose our sponges, we lose our habitat. Without anything filtering out the bacteria in the water column, we get further proliferation of chain-forming cyanobacteria and an increase in our harmful algal blooms. So, oh, and also that shade of green is what the water actually looks like in the Florida Keys when we have a bloom building up. That's, that's the natural color. So in what follows is a map of the locations of my study sites in the Florida Keys. 
This is a shallow environment consisting of patchily distributed habitats of mangroves, sea, um, seagrasses, sand and mud bottoms, and hard bottom. And primarily I'm gonna focus on hard bottom habitats, which are these low relief um, limestone bedrocks that are covered by a thin veneer of se sediment. And following a series of harmful algal blooms in the 80s and 90s, approximately 90% of sponges have been removed in a greater than 500 square kilometer area. So the question is, with the loss of these sponges, what happens to these ecosystems that they formerly inhabited? Well, to answer this question, we have to explore the ecosystem functions of sponges themselves. So this study represents the first chapter of my dissertation, in which I sought to determine how sponge identity and biomass interact across a variety of tidal regimes to alter the planktonic composition and nutrient availability in the Florida Keys. So to date, studies on the effects of sponges and their associated symbionts on nutrient cyclings have relied on the use of incubator-based measurements. And this may over or underestimate the effect of nutrient cycling and particle filtration of sponges because these sponges are filtering the same water constantly over several hours. So we have a decline in oxygen, a decline in nutrient availability, and the buildup in waste. So for this experiment, I eschewed the traditional aquaria. And instead, I designed myself and constructed these custom unidirectional flow through flumes. It took me a lot of practice to not flub that line. Um, so these flow through seawater flumes were designed to emulate the natural movement of water and enable easier manipulation of sponge communities, which is not uh, accomplished so easily in situ. So we have water coming in through these intakes and it hits this baffle system, which spreads and smooths the flow of water to make it more laminar. This moves through the tank and rather than having the water hit the rear wall and then cycle back through the tank, I spent a lot of time estimating the appropriate angle of a ramp um, at the back of the tank so that water would slowly move out of the system without recirculating. And then I basically had a tap system on the back of the tank where I could collect my sample water. So I constructed six tanks for each trial. So I would have four haphazardly selected treatments and two controls, which I was running simultaneously. To give you an idea of scale, you can fit a large number of sponges or approximately one graduate student in these tanks. They're quite large. So I performed a three-way analysis of variance to design, the test to, to design to test the effects of biomass flow and identity. And I based these biomass and flow rates off of surveys that I did in the field and then scaled them to the size of the tanks so that I could properly mimic the natural environment. So this comes to approximately 44 treatments if you include the controls for this one experiment. So I had 10 species of sponge and I tested them at high biomass and low biomass and then I tested each of those biomass combinations for each species at a low flow treatment and then at a high flow treatment. So I really wish someone had been around to tell me that that was way too many treatments and I should have scaled it down by just a few species. So to demonstrate that I did the test that I said that I did, all treatments were standardized to sponge volume and mesocosm turnover rates. Um, so if we look at say the high biomass, low flow, this negative number, don't get scared about it, it just means that the sponges were able to instantaneously filter through the entire water within the system versus our say low biomass high flow where it takes the sponges approximately 24 minutes based on turnover to filter through the system. So as I previously mentioned, sponges have these incredible regeneration rates. So to have unique individuals for all 44 trials and have a significant in, I needed approximately 6,000 sponges, which is quite a lot. But you can take a large sponge and chop it into many pieces and then zip tie it to a brick and toss it back into the ocean. And a few weeks later, you have a sponge. So what we do is take that large sponge, we'll cut it to something about the palm of your sand or fist, you attach it to the brick, you place it on the seafloor, and approximately two weeks later, you have a sponge that's completely healed over and beginning to grow again. And then of course, all the sponges that we did harvest, we left enough tissue behind so that we were able to regrow those natural sponges. So I wasn't just clear cutting the Florida Keys. 
<clears throat> so again, I had 10 species of sponge in this system. And then for my control, I had uh, seasoned bricks. So all these sponges are attached to bricks, which I also left in the water for the same period of time so that I could account for any chemical dissolution of that uh, treatment. So um, I would go out and collect these sponges. I needed approximately 200 a day. Someone uh, compared me to a human otter once in which I would line up seven sponges across the torso and swim on my back <laughs> to the boat and then load them into the boat and then swim back out and do it again. And it, it took quite a long time because I did uh, most of this research alone. So uh, that was a fun part of my, my day is swimming with my, my sponges. So I brought them back. I acclimated them for 24 hours. And that's about how long it took to also scrub all the epibionts off of the bricks and remove any invading species. So oftentimes I would find lobsters, fishes, crabs, octopus swimming through my tanks throughout the day. So I had to remove all of those from the system. <clears throat> so as a reminder, I collected water from the end of that pipe. And for each trial, I collected two liters of water to measure dissolved and particulate water columns constituents. <clears throat> I then used epifluorescent microscopy to enumerate heterotrophic bacteria and protists and then phototrophic nano and pictoplankton in the water column. And I selected all of these because they're um, environmentally relevant variables. And because of time limitations, I'm not going into the laboratory analytics. So if you want to ask me about that later, I'd be more than happy to tell you. So first, we're going to look at the effect of species identity meaned across the four treatment groups. So on our x-axis, we have our species. Along our y-axis, we have whether the uh, selected response variable increased or decreased in concentration. Our lowercase letters indicate statistical significance of a post hoc Tukey's test where p is less than 0.05. And then, of course, our error bars are one standard deviation from the mean. <clears throat> so. Uh, what we're seeing here in these graphs is that sponge identity plays a very unique role and that no sponge species has the same strength of effect on any of our selected response variables. They're each different in who is the best performer amongst them. So we're seeing that sponge identity very much matters. So now we'll look at the effect of the four treatment groups mean across our 10 species. So x axis is high biomass, high flow, low biomass, high flow, et cetera, and the same increase or decrease in our response variables. And what we see here is that the effects are very much dependent on their local environment and conditions, as well as sponge biomass. So with the exception of uh, dissolved organic carbon, where we see no effect of treatment, in all cases, high biomass and low flow has a significant effect of reducing or increasing that particular response variable. So as I mentioned previously, um, in the literature, sponges are reported to remove close to 90% of bacteria from the water column. So I sum sampled five of my species, and the results of our three-way ANOVA conducted on the change of bacteria relative to their control found that there was a significant effect, there was no significant effect of either biomass or flow on the concentration of bacteria. That said, the third factor, species identity, was found to have a significant effect on bacterial concentration, just as we would have predicted with the results of the earlier comparisons. And just to point out, the two species which had the largest effect on bacteria concentrations are both LMA sponges. So potentially, that microbial association is affecting the concentration of bacteria in the water column. So just in summary, this is the first time a study used a flow-through mesocosm to assess the effects of sponges on the water column in any sort of manipulative way at a realistic scale. And what we see here implies that species identity matters greatly for the concentrations of response variables, but that it is always dependent on which response variable is measured as well as flow regime. And then, of course, the effects of the variables were largest at high biomass, low flow conditions. So now you all know that species identity, biomass, and flow regime matters for ecosystem effects. But sponges don't occur naturally in monoculture. They're very diverse. So how can I easily extrapolate the findings of my first experiment up to an ecosystem scale for the sponges that were once so abundant in the Florida Keys? Well, 
can't. So that leads me into my second chapter. So filter feeding organisms are often considered to be functionally redundant. Basically, they're like air screens that are sitting on the seafloor, just collecting any particle that passes them by. This is especially true when you look at the literature on marine sponges. However, in my previous chapter, we see that each sponge had a unique and often idiosyncratic effect on response variables. So to explore the functional role of marine sponges in a larger context, it's important to investigate how changes in community metrics, such as diversity, affects ecosystem function, and then determine the relative effects of varying levels of sponge diversity and functional diversity in controlling the composition of plankton and nutrient cycling. So in an additional set of experience, experiments, I created 10 different mixtures, or sorry, I created several different mixtures of species. One was 10 species, and then I had a subset of four in which I did every combination of pairs, triplets, and a group of four of those species. So if you add up all of the treatments from this experiment and all of the treatments from the first set of experiments, it comes to approximately 128 treatments. A little, uh, little out of the range of what any graduate student should have attempted. So this is an incredibly complex set of data that I'm gonna try and summarize for you very quickly. So to do that, I ranked each treatment from my first experiment and each treatment from the second set of experiments between one and 22. So we have the 22 at high biomass, low flow. We subsected those out. So we ranked them one for weakest, 22 to highest. <clears throat> um, so what you see on the x-axis is the number of species present. So from one species present to 10, and then along our y-axis is going to be the rank. Um, and then this red bar is the mean of all of the monocultures for that particular treatment. And then the dotted line is our logistic regression. So what you see is that as the number of species present increases in my treatments, so too does the degree of change that we see. Now this is a very broad brush <clears throat> view. And we can see that the largest effects are generally when the largest number of species are present. So this curve implies that increasing diversity is additive in some extent. However, we do have evidence of transgressive overyielding. So to define that for the non-traditional ecologists in the room, this is an instance in which an individual will have a stronger effect on the dependent variable than does the polyculture treatments. Now, as we can see, there are very few instances in which a single or lower number of species will outperform our polyculture with the exception of our fifth variable, phosphate. Um, so this is where we see the largest number of transgressive overyield in cases in which the polyculture severely underperforms in comparison to a series of monocultures. So what this is indicating is that in some cases, species identity matters more than species richness, which suggests that a sampling effect could be in play. So just to define that, it means that if you sample enough species you will eventually find one or two species that will outperform the sum of all the rest. So why is that happening? Well, perhaps each sponge's functional traits might affect the biogeochemical cycling of nutrients. So first, we might want to look at the relationship between sponges and their bacterial symbionts. Then we might want to look at their morphology and size. Are they changing the local hydrodynamics of their area? How could this be affecting the uptake of nutrients? And then finally, we might wanna consider their life history. Are they a small, rapidly recruiting species or are they a large, slow growth organism? So I divided up those 10 species and sorted them based on their functional traits. So based on those results of an Akaiki information criterion, much of the variability in my experiment is determined by the relationship between sponges and their microbiome. And as each sponge has a unique microbiome, it's likely that some species would have a greater effect on a different set of response variables. For example, with the LMA sponges, they tend to have a greater effect or a greater concentration of nitrifying bacteria, hence they would have a larger effect on the concentrations of nitrite and nitrate. <clears throat> We also secondarily, based on that AIC, 
saw that morphology played an important role on the utilization of nutrients. So perhaps larger sponges are in effect current shading <clears throat> with two possible outcomes. They may be decelerating water flow, permitting a greater fraction of resources to be utilized in the slower current, or they may be enhancing turbulent mixing, which reduces the depth of that boundary layer and thus increases the resource supply to smaller sponges. And in fact, whenever I do my diver surveys, you will often find the smaller sponges clustered around the base of your larger species. So to revisit the idea that sponges are functionally redundant, what you're seeing in front of you is a heat map of the treatment effect of the five response variables. So light purple indicates having the weakest effect versus the blue having the strongest effect. So if sponges are truly functionally redundant, then we would see no variability in our response variables. Our heat map would look like this. But as you can see here, each species in combination has its own unique effect. This means that species in an assemblage are not substitutive and redundant, but perhaps there are some aspects of sponge physiology and community interactions that we have yet to explore. So the results imply that we have some sort of diversity or volume effect that is non-additive. So when sponges are absent, the water is very turbid, we have high concentrations of chlorophyll, bacteria, DOC, and ammonia. When we have low sponge diversity, we do see some pretty sharp decreases in the concentrations of bacteria, say about 50%, and increases in the availability of nitrite and nitrate. But when we increase just four species, we're seeing almost 100% reduction in bacteria, a large decrease in concentrations of dissolved organic carbon and chlorophyll A. But when we go up to that 10 species diversity, while greater than our low sponge diversity, we are seeing weaker effects than in our medium sponge diversity. So this again implies we have a sampling effect. So most of what is known about the effects of sponges on nutrient cycling and plankton composition have come from studies based on individual species of sponges. And this is the very first study conducted on how diverse assemblages affect marine ecosystems and the linear trajectory of the effect of species additions on water column resources observed in the study suggests that the accumulation of just a few species enhances community ecosystem functioning through some kind of ecological facilitation. However, there are possible emergent effects, meaning we are not simply having an additive system. And this is inhibiting the strength of increasing species richness and confounding the interpretation of our biodiversity experiments. So based on the results of my first two chapters, I found evidence of some variability in ecosystem effects based on species richness and identity. This means there are some emergent effects that I have not yet addressed, which may affect sponge ecosystem functions. And one possible explanation for this is competition for resources. So food limitation is a powerful selective force that affects the metabolism, growth, and reproduction and distribution of sessile suspension feeding communities. And in many cases, an increase in biomass of community leads to an increase in the depletion of water column resources and a decrease in individual growth and recruitment. And while this is accepted for most marine filter feeders such as bivalves and barnacles, it is widely rejected in the literature for marine sponges. And this is the cause of a very heated and patrolic debate within sponge biologists. Uh, it's always fun to see this discussed at a conference. So our understanding of sponge interactions and the effect on ecosystem functions have largely developed from studies conducted on coral reefs, where they are prolific and diverse, and there are hundreds of species cataloged in the Caribbean alone. Now these sponges compete vigorously with other sponges and a variety of sessile out organisms for space on coral reefs. And they have evolved a complex mix of toxic chemical compounds to deter competitors and predators. And the movement, <coughs> um, sorry. And these reefs are also unique hydrodynamic environments. And water here is constantly turned over and the movement is integral to the flux of resources such as DOC that sponges feed upon. Now the large 
volume of water and the short resonance time coupled with strong selective pressures exerted by both predators and competitors for space have limited efforts thus far to determine if sponges do indeed compete for food. So in the hard bottom where I worked, um, the sponge communities are composed of a unique mixtures of species. They're rarely found along the reef track. We only have approximately 80 species in this uh, ecosystem and rarely do they have to compete for space and their growth is largely undeterred by spongivores and other predators so they're not having to pay that energetic toll to produce a lelopathic deterrence. Now, as I mentioned, Floor Bay is largely predator free and in some cases could be a refuge for sponges. And unlike on the coral reef tracks where the water resonance times are generally high, evidence from my previous chapter show filtration by dense communities of sponge, sponges deplete the water column of picoplankton, setting the stage for intense competition of planktonic food resources. So sponge growth is variable and in some cases seems to be affected by the presence or absence of older conspecifics. And as there are few predators and minimal competition for space, it's reasonable for me to hypothesize that sponge growth is controlled by density dependent food competition. Thus I hypothesize that the limitation of quantity of food available to sponges is sufficient enough to influence individual growth manifesting in the form of water column depletion. So to test this hypothesis, I decided to deploy these sponges attached to bricks and measure their increase or decrease in growth over time on background sponge, based on background sponge, sponge abundance. So this time individual sponges were cut and to uniform and precise pieces and given an ID tag so that I could track individual genotypes over time and space for three of the species I tested earlier. So to begin this study, 20 sites were surveyed to assess sponge distributions. They were mapped with the aid of scuba and over 100 meter square areas. And within each quadrat, sponges the size of a golf ball or greater were measured to estimate volume. So to show you that I did the test that I said that I did, we sorted all of these sites into three categories, low volume, medium volume, and high volume. So at our low volume sites, we have approximately 10,000 cubic meters of sponges versus our high volume sites where we have about 70,000 cubic meters of sponges. So that's quite a, quite a large difference. So individual clones were divided among nine transplant sites. Um, so we have the high volume sites, and this approximates to about three golf ball size sponges per meter squared. Three medium volume sites, which is approximately one large sponge per meter square. And then in the area where we have recurrent harmful algal blooms, there are no sponges to be found in the seascape. So there's no other sponges that could potentially be competing for food. So every six months, I went out and collected these sponges. I removed all of the fouling organisms that were growing on the bricks and the sponges themselves. And I measured the height, width, and diameter of these sponges to estimate the increase or decrease in volume. And this is a standardized technique in the literature. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, after about six months, this flat piece of sponge will begin to cup. At a year, we start to see an increase in rugosity of the skin. So they're increasing their surface area to increase filtration. A year and a half, just a general increase in size. And after about two years, we have a fairly large species or individual of sponge. So they get about basketball size over the course of two years. So that's a pretty rapid growth rate. So to dive right into the data, on our x-axis, I have the high, medium, and low volume sites. On our y-axis, we're gonna look at the percent change over six months. So at the low sites, the vase and the yellow sponge had astronomical growth in the first six months. And while not as impressive, the transplants at the medium sites still had two times more increase in growth than at the high sites. Now I do wanna say that growth at the low volume sites was correlated with the beginnings of a harmful algal bloom. And as I've stated before, bacteria are a major form of food for these sponges. So what we're seeing is a decrease in competitors and an increase in available food. So this is when we get this astronomical growth rate. Unfortunately, with that growth rate, there's also mass mortality. 
So when these harmful algal blooms come through, if they get sufficiently dense enough, then all of the sponges are wiped out in these areas and you have to start back at zero. All's not lost, however, we still see significant effects between the high and medium volume sites. So this is the total volume increase over the entirety of a three year study period. So again, X axis is our sites, Y is total volume increase. And while there is some species dependence, generally growth is always significantly greater <clears throat> when there are less sponges present. Um, and just as a side note on this, I didn't show you any seasonal data. Sponges have this really cool effect in the winter where they just slough off their outer panachoderm. And what they're doing is getting rid of the epibionts and the sediments that have settled on their tissues. So in the winter, it was really distressing the first time I measured them when all of my sponges shrank in size and I was, was very perturbed. But I went to the literature and apparently sloughing is a normal behavior. <laughs> so in addition to the growth, I collected water column samples at slack tide when water movement was minimal, thereby standardizing the effect of flow to document the potential mechanisms whereby growth among my treatments might vary. And what we see is that at medium and high sites, we have very similar decreases in the availability of a variety of particulate organic matters, both for carbons and nitrogens and for a variety of water column constituents. Now this might be confusing since growth at high and medium sites were significantly different, but perhaps what is happening that at low water exchange, both sites are able to rapidly deplete the water column. When we have that increase in flow rate, the um, <clears throat> high volume sites are still able to deplete those water column resources. So this is pretty striking evidence that sponges <clears throat> um, are competing interspecifically for food in the Florida Keys and that water column depletions within these areas <clears throat> Uh, show us that sponges are indeed removing large quantities of aquatic organisms based on their background density. So based on much of the nutrients, but <clears throat> because much of the nutrient cycling on sponges has been attributed to their endosymbionts, it's essential for us to understand how the composition and stability of their microbial consortia vary in the face of these harmful algal blooms. So, um, when environmental conditions play a role in structuring these microbial communities, <clears throat> particularly in sites where we have fluctuations in temperature, salinity, turbidity, and food limitation. Now results from the literature seem contradictory as some symbiote communities are variable and change temporally and spatially, whereas others seem stable, i.e. sponges don't follow any particular pattern. We again have a divided camp. So, <clears throat> when sponges are exposed to these strong environmental stressors, sometimes instead of a symbiosis, they have a dysbiosis. What this means is that we have a divergence of microbial consortia from that present in healthy individuals. So the goal of this chapter was to describe the community composition and stability of bacterial symbionts among sponge species transplanted between two locations that varied appreciably in terms of environmental conditions. So we have two sites. We have a relatively healthy site. Uh, it has constant environmental conditions throughout the year versus one site here in the harmful algal bloom area where they are constantly disturbed. So first we're gonna look at the dominant um, microbial species over time. So for each of these three species, their microbial consortia were dominated by proteobacteria, chloriflexi, cyanobacteria, and acidobacteria. And this heat map is, sorry, I forgot to mention it, is showing us the relative abundance of the common phyla. And we had just a few phyla that were found only in each individual. So if we look at this Venn diagram, looking at the overlap of organisms found in each of our three species, we can see that they share a 42.6% core taxa, so very similar. But each species also has its own unique phyla. For example, the vase sponge, Arsenia campana, has a less than 0.5% overlap in its microbial consortia with the glove sponge, Spongia graminea, and only a 1.7% overlap with the yellow sponge, Spongia barabara. 
down. So looking at this heat map, we have red, which is our disturbed sites. And we're going to look at the patterns of changes in microbial consortia. And we can see it's pretty inconsistent across species. We're, we have some, say, the proteobacteria is consistent across our organisms in our disturbed sites. Cyanobacteria, in some cases, decreases or increases based on the presence of disturbance. And if we look at our minimally perturbed sites, we do see some environmental variability, but much less than in our disturbed sites. So this indicates that we might have some seasonal component. And I wish that I'd been able to carry out the study a bit longer, but you know, harmful algal blooms and all, they will destroy your field sites. And also aluminumiseq is a very expensive sequencing technique. So this is the last figure I'm going to show you, and it's a canonical, <coughs> canonical correlation analysis that I performed to explore the relationships between the multivariate set of variables from the different sampling sites based over time. So on the bottom, we have um, species, and on the left, we have site. So we see, again, that we have overlap between our glove and yellow sponge. We have a very distinct and tightly grouped microbial consortia within our base sponge. And so this shows us that the variation in microbial symbiont community structure was often driven primarily by host sponge species and then secondarily by site. So in summary, my results show that the microbial consortia in these three tropical sponges differed appreciably among species, but they were remarkably stable when exposed to perturbation. However, if I had sampled these sponges closer to their HABs-related mortality, perhaps we would have seen a more extreme response. So the stability of the microbiomes of these Florida-based sponges indicate that perhaps that the changes in their microbiome is not what is leading to their mass mortality. So finally, just to sum up what I've shown you so far, it's essential that we discover the patterns that exist in sponges and their function under changing environmental conditions. And this is very useful for marine spatial planning, the predictions of future climate change and habitat alteration, and the identification of potential sites for conservation and protection. So my work makes clear the implications of reduction in natural densities and diversity of sponges in terms of significant alterations in the ecosystem's natural biogeochemical cycles and benthic pelagic linkages. And the recovery of sponges takes decades, and it follows a strict successional sequence. And that starts with the establishment of those small, rapidly colonizing species, and ultimately culminates in a diverse community replete with large climax species. Now, unfortunately, restoration efforts so far have only focused on restoring those individuals that are most beneficial to fisheries and tourism. So there's three species that are particularly large or arboreal, and these are the best habitat for that, that uh, Caribbean spiny lobster to live within. Unfortunately, these three species also have the weakest effects on water column constituents. So I'm hoping that some of my work will be used by the Fish and Wildlife Service in Florida when they continue the restoration efforts of the Florida Key sponges and focus on restoring diverse communities rather than just a few important species for one fishery. So there are some other um, areas that I went into, including carbon sequestration of sponges. I've looked at their economic ramifications of their loss and then doing ecosystem-wide modeling and projections of these assemblages effects. Unfortunately, I only have 45 minutes, which I have just made it under, so I cannot talk about the final chapters of my dissertation with you today. It's quite a, a large body of work. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone that was involved, particularly everyone that funded my research, which was the EPA um, and Sea Grant, and then everyone else that assisted me in conducting my research. With that, I'll take any questions you might have. Come on, guys. Sponges are cool. Ask me a question. <laughs> Real nice top and that. What's the situation right now with the barrel sponge disease impacts in the pond? Or is it period where there's a large loss of 
Okay, so the question was about the impacts of barrel sponges throughout, I'm assuming the Caribbean, that's where they're most commonly found. So for the rest of the audience, barrel sponges are uh, Zestospongia muta. They are one of the sponges that grows the largest. That picture with the diver that was next to it uh, is a barrel sponge. And they're a really important uh, part of the habitat and the cycling of nutrients on coral reefs. They're not in my backwater habitats. And unfortunately, there has been rampant disease in the past couple of years that eats away at the tissue. Um, so I don't know what the status is of it currently, but two years ago I was doing a barrel sponge mission um, in the Keys, and it was it was quite rampant. You would see often just pieces of the barrel sponge rolling away. So I don't know if that has improved any recently. I would suspect not. With again, we have, we've been having some really hot, super saline water at the sea floor, which often spreads that disease. Um, so I wouldn't say that. In my estimation, it probably has not improved, but I haven't seen it the that area in about two years. Yeah. And we do have a question online. Oh, okay. Um, someone would like to know, is there any correlation with sponges and a current coral disease? Ah, correlation between sponges and coral disease. Well, I don't know that anyone has directly looked at that effect, but sponges consume bacteria. So any, and they also uh, consume a lot of viruses as well. So I wouldn't, I would not hypothesize that they would further the spread of coral disease. But I wouldn't wouldn't go so far as to say that they're mitigating any effects. But that would be a great research area if someone someone wanted to explore or trace coral disease through the sponge uh, filtration cycle. Um, are sponges spawning? And like how did, how so, did get their different microbial Sponge reproduction is one of those great mysteries of the world. Um, <laughs> I know many, many people who have attempted to study sponge reproduction and it is a nightmare. Um, but so there's, they have two different ways. Obviously, they're clonal. You can tear them apart and we get two individuals. But they also um, spawn. And um, so we have the intermixings of our, our sperm and eggs. Um, Another one of the great mysteries. I think there's been exactly two papers in the literature. One said that it, the microbiomes are vertically transmitted, and the other one says that they get it from the environment. So I cannot provide you with an answer on whether it's vertical or horizontal transmission of the microbiomes. Okay. Yeah. And, um, we do have another question online. Okay. Um, did you find sedimentation had any effect on the growth of your fragments? Oh, sedimentation. Because I was regularly handling them, they never really got that big buildup of sedimentation that you see on a lot of sponges. A lot of times you'll see them and they're just covered in sort of brown detrital material. And, and I suspect that that does greatly reduce their growth rate because that's covering their intake, right? They can't bring in food. They don't, they can't eat, they're basically starving, which I suspect is why they slough off their skin every winter so that they can can then increase because they have greater food availability. How applicable are the management implications of your project outside of the Florida Keys, i.e. like restoration? Restoration work outside of the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. So there are other similar areas um, if we look at Indian Key Basin or Tarpon Springs, um, I would say Indian Key is the most similar because it also influ gets like regular harmful algal blooms. Um, and I don't know that there has been much, if any, restoration work of sponges there. So definitely this sort of mass outplanting would be something that, that they should take into account. Tarpon Springs is much different because there's greater movement of water through that area and it's also a massive fishery, whereas the Florida Keys is much more artisanal. Um, so the restoration work we do with these sponges usually occurs when universities have holidays in which we will ship down 30 undergraduates and they will spend all day just hack and slash attaching sponges to bricks and putting that out in the water. We can produce 10,000 cuttings fairly rapidly that way, although it's very itchy, unrewarding work, and it's cold. It's usually winter when students have breaks. Um, 
So I wasn't part. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was my involvement with the planning of work in National Marine Sanctuaries. So most of my work occurred in the Everglades National Park, not in the sanctuaries themselves. But I did work quite a bit with Sea Grant and Fish and Wildlife Services. They were a part of most of the restoration work. So that there were joint grants that we had um, in identifying sites and then doing the outplanning itself. Um, so I'm not familiar with the Florida Keys as much, but in other portions of the Western Atlantic uh, coral reef systems and colonized hard bottoms, you see a strong association of sponges and octocorals in these areas. And the octocorals are often providing intermediate habitat for species that are going off the reef, foraging, taking advantage of other movements. And I'm curious if there is any strong interactions that you're observing between sponges and octocorals. There are octocorals in the hard bottom of the Florida Keys, but they're they're much less common. They're more, I guess, stochastic when you just happen upon one. They're not not super common to see. Really, if you if you go to the Florida Keys and swim around, if there are not sponges, there is no other form of structure in any in any form. You'll get the occasional you knobby know, coral, and that's that's it. Yeah, it's just hard bottom or algae bottom. So there's some sea grass, but yeah, nothing nothing of the size of an octocoral or a sponge is there. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering to what extent do they utilize the sponges utilize uh, dissolved organic carbon uh, compared to microplankton and other Okay, so the question was how sponges interact with dissolved organic materials versus sort of planktonic or particulate matter. So that is a great question. Um, so those HMA high microbial abundant sponges, they're the one taking up the majority of the dissolved organic material. Whereas the LMA sponges which do not have those microbial constituents, they're the ones that consume more of the particulate material. And they're using that for food. So they're the ones that usually take up more bacteria, more phytoplankton than, than the HMAs. Yep, so so two distinct sort of functional groups and their food consumption. Any other questions in the room? Okay. Well, thank you, Marla, thank for you. presenting. And um, thank you for everyone who attended. We hope you will also keep an eye out for future presentations in the series. Thanks, y'all.